and turn or open or whatever you use, a tablet or book, and get, join me there in Matthew chapter 11. As we enter into Matthew chapter 11, we see a familiar name uh, that we saw earlier in this book. Uh, and you can tell by the title of the message this morning, that man is John the Baptist. Uh, well, you say, what, what's old John been up to? Well, in verse number 2, we see what John's been up to. John's done, gone and got himself arrested. Uh, John is in prison. Uh, he chose to uh, take a stand for God and be committed to God and uh, preach the Word of God. And uh, for that, there are consequences. And may I tell you, there will always be consequences for standing up for Christ. Uh, he told us, he said, the world's going to hate you because it hated me first, okay? So uh, we need to understand, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, they, they want that, that inroad, they want that heaven at the end of it, uh, but there's going to be some bumps along the way. Uh, and if you're not facing some sort of persecution because you're a child of God, I'm going to tell you, you're not doing it right. Uh, because the Bible says they're going to hate us because it hated him, and so... Uh, we see that. Well, I, I want to take our time this morning and look at, at John and, and Jesus during this uh, interaction, if you will. Technically, they don't interact with one another. They interact uh, through the disciples of John. Um, but the last time that we saw John, if you'll remember, he was pointing people to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, and uh, he actually baptized Jesus. We saw all of that uh, a good ways back. Uh, well, now it seems that he has some questions that have popped into his head about Jesus. Uh, and he is seeking the answers. Well, Jesus is more than happy to provide the answers for him. Uh, and then he goes on to tell the people uh, just how special John the Baptist is. And so I want to get started here as we uh, look at the very beginning here. Uh, we see the, the probe that takes place. Uh, right here at uh, chapter 11, the first three verses says, When Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the cities. And now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word uh, by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Uh, and so here's the situation. Again, uh, John is in prison, ironically, for preaching and teaching about the Messiah. Uh, he is, uh, we learned about his arrest all the way back in Matthew chapter number 4. It didn't tell us anything about it, just that he had been arrested, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. But we see, uh, and we're, we're going to see the full story of his imprisonment when we get over to Matthew chapter 14. So because of that, I'm not going to take a lot of time this morning and, and tell you about John in prison. That's not what I want to focus on. We'll focus on that when we get into uh, Matthew chapter 14. Uh, but just understand the situation. Here's John. He's in prison. He doesn't have the access to be able to watch the things that Jesus is doing. Okay, he, he's not able to go see Jesus preach. He's not able to see the miracles that Jesus is performing. Everything that he's hearing or every uh, word that he's receiving is coming from somebody else. And so that's the situation. Well, John's hearing these things, but it causes him to, to begin to seek some answers about what he's hearing. Uh, it's obvious by his question that reports of Jesus' work had reached him in prison, and having no way to be a part of it himself... He sends his disciples to ask these questions of Jesus to appease his own curiosity. And we see the question in verse number 3. It says, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now this can be kind of confusing because we know from John chapter 19, verse 1, uh, John chapter 1, verses 9, uh, 29 through 36, when, Jesus, when John saw Jesus in the wilderness, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, And so at that point, he acknowledged who Jesus was. Now by this question, it would seem that now John has some doubts. And so there are a couple of possibilities to consider when we deal with his question. The first is the possibility that John misunderstood the ministry of the Messiah. Uh, he, like others, had been looking for the Messiah to act in a what we might call today a more political way than what he did. 
Remember, the popular belief in that day was that Jesus was going to come or the Messiah was going to come. He was going to set up his kingdom here on the earth. And if he was going to do that, that means he had to overthrow the current kingdom that was in charge of the Jews, and that was the Romans. And so that's what a lot of the Jewish people were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah to come, overthrow the Romans, set up a new kingdom where they're now free and live under this new king or this Messiah. Uh, and so that could have been confusing John he, because that's not what was happening. Uh, as John's receiving all this information, he's not receiving any kind of word that, that it's working toward that end. The second thing is there is a possibility that there was a mistaken distinction between the coming one and the Messiah. Uh, during the time, this time, there were some that drew a distinction between the prophet that was promised by Moses back in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and the Messiah. They saw them as two different individuals. Now, we look at that and well, you say, well, silly, that's who, they is. That's who it is. It's Jesus. I think sometimes when we're looking at the Bible, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, we forget that we have a whole lot more information than what they had. Okay, so, so we can be hard on John for asking these questions, but we need to remember we're, we're reading all this after it's all happened. We're reading this all after the fact. So he already has all of this information, or he doesn't have all the information that we have. Okay? Whatever the case is, it is clear that John's time in prison had caused some confusion to him. Maybe he was thinking that had this truly been the Messiah, he wouldn't still be in prison. Maybe he was thinking that, that this would have taken care of, the kingdom would have been taken care of, and he'd be out of prison. But don't overlook the key that we find in these first few verses. John had a question. So he sought an answer. This is something that we could all learn when it comes to the things of God. If you have a question, look for an answer. Don't just go on about with no answer to your question. Don't make up an answer to your question. Uh, if you want to know, ask. Uh, if, if you want to ask, ask God. God will send somebody in your way, if not the Holy Spirit, to, to help your heart or send somebody that can help explain what it is. But when it comes to the things of God, it does us no good to not know what we're talking about. Ask the question. John needed an answer, so he asked. Well, Jesus was faithful to provide an answer. We see the proof here in verses 4 through 6. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So we see the answer here. Please take note of how, what Jesus, or how Jesus responds to John or how he answers. There is no rebuke on Jesus' part toward John for asking the question. You know, I think sometimes we think that we're going to be rebuked, Jesus is going to punish us for asking a question. But if you have a question, the best thing to do is what? Ask it. I can promise you this, you'll never receive an answer to a question you don't ask. And I don't believe God's going to punish us because we want to ask questions that we don't completely understand. God's desire is for us to completely understand the Word of God. And so if we don't understand it, ask a question. But there's no rebuke. He simply says, go tell John what you hear and what you see. Church, you need to underline that verse. That's what you call a testimony. You know, we, we think of testimony as this religious word, but it's not. A testimony is certainly it's, it's something just telling, what did you see, what did you hear? Now, if you get called into court, you get called to, to testify or to give a testimony, what are they asking you? What you saw, what you heard. To, to give the evidence. What is it that you saw? What is it that you heard? Uh, help us understand what this is by you giving us your account of the events. Many shy away from telling people about Jesus, and they try to hide behind the excuse, I don't know what to say. You don't have to have a Bible college or seminary 
be a seminary graduate to simply tell people what you have seen and what you have heard. How did God's word speak to you? What brought you to the point that you decided to make a decision for Jesus? Tell that. God's not looking for you to get up and give a three-point alliterated sermon to everybody that needs to know the gospel. He's simply asking you to go tell them. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know that God loves you? How many of you have experienced the love of God? How many of you have experienced salvation? So by your own witness, you're there. So why aren't we telling anybody? Let me ask this. How many people think Jesus is the answer to the problems that we have in our country and world today? So you see the problem, you know the answer, but you're not going to give it. Is that what we're saying? Now don't raise your hand on this, but how many shared the gospel this week? So you know the problem, you know the solution, you just don't want to do anything to fix it? Go and tell and see, go and tell what you have seen and what you have heard. Then we see the affirmation here in verses 4 through 5. Jesus wanted to assure John and his disciples that yes, he indeed was the Messiah. It could have been that John was expecting that Jesus would have done more. Again, looking at a more political change, looking at a a change in in the, uh, the kingdom work and all of those things that they were looking for. But Jesus wasn't working toward a political change. Jesus shows what us what he was working toward in our verse, challenge verse for the month. I told you it's also here in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to set up this earthly kingdom. He came to serve. And so if John wants proof that he is the Messiah, all you need to do is look and ask yourself, is he serving? But notice his serving wasn't for himself. His serving was for others. He was doing those things that only God could do. So by serving others, doing the things that only God could do, he was proving that, yes, indeed, he was the Messiah. He was giving sight to the blind, making the lame to walk, leopards cleansed, death to hear, the dead were raised up. All of these things. None of these things could anybody else do but God. But Jesus was doing all of them. He said, go and tell what you saw. And once you tell what you saw, there would be no doubt left that, yes, he was the Messiah. So no, Jesus wasn't doing things the way they thought they should be done. But he was doing what needed to be done. How many have ever been going somewhere and and somebody said, well, just follow me? You have in your mind where they're going and how they're going to get there, right? If you know where you're heading. And all of a sudden, you would have gone straight, but they take a left. You think to yourself, well, I'd have gone straight, but okay. They said, follow them, and so you take a left. So you go on about this business, and they keep on, and and, and you get there. Well, guess what happens You get to the place that you're going. So it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go, but it didn't mean it didn't accomplish the goal. As the Messiah, he wasn't doing the things that he thought they should do, or they thought he should do, but he was proving that he was, yes, indeed the Messiah. Because he was doing the only things that God could do only things that the Messiah could do. It's interesting, the same proof that Jesus instructs them to send back to John is the same proof that Matthew focuses on in his gospel because he's trying to show the Jews, prove to the Jews that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. And so those same things that Jesus said, hey, take these things and tell them to John, 
Matthew has been focusing on telling us those things, or, or more specifically in that day, telling the Jews those things, so that they would understand that, yes, this is the Messiah. Well, then we see the assurance there in verse 6. He says, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus knew that some of the Jews would be offended because he was not doing things according to their expectation. They longed for that freedom from Roman oppression, and it didn't look like that was what was going to happen. Jesus tells them there is a blessing for those who are not offended because he's not doing things the way they think they ought to do them. If you're trying to outthink Jesus every step of the way, you're not going to receive the blessing. The blessing is when we just let go and let God. Isn't it amazing watching God work? There, there have been times in my life where, you know, I'm like, okay, God, it's, 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 it's you. It's all you right now. And then after it's all over, you just sit back and say, man, how good is my God? As he just takes care of these things. Why? Now, I would have missed the blessing had I sat there and tried to figure it out all along the way. But I, at the beginning, said, I don't have the answer. God, you've got the answer. You work this out. Let's see what you can do with it. And we receive the blessing. Whatever may have caused John to need proof that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus certainly did not need any proof that John was a faithful servant. So John, he's sitting there, and now, if you can imagine, some people would probably be offended by the fact that John would even ask. John, why would you even ask if this is the Messiah? This, you, you're the one that said, behold, you know. So, so I think that's part of what Jesus is doing here. He said, hold on, before you get some thoughts up about John that you ought not to be having, let me tell you some things about John. And so Jesus here in the next couple of verses begins to sing the praises of John the Baptist. Now, I don't know about you. We're not supposed to be prideful people. But if Jesus were singing my praises, how many of you think your chest might pump out just a little bit? Notice what he says about John. And this is what I want you to pay attention on. Because if this got the praise from God, how many of you think that if we would live this way, God would be happy with us? The first thing that we see here is that John was steady. Look at verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Jesus says, John was steady. He, he says, he didn't, what, did you, what did you think you were going to find? When you went out looking for this John the Baptist, when you went out to hear him, when you went out to try to find him, you're going out in the wilderness. What did you think you're going to find? Just some little weak reed shaken by the wind? There are many that think believers are weak and that we just use Jesus as a crutch. Let me tell you something. Don't confuse despair. Uh, our dependence with weakness. Yes, we depend on Jesus. That doesn't mean we're weak. That means we're looking to something better than ourselves. Yeah, yes, we need Jesus, but it doesn't make us a reed shaken by the wind. We can stand steady knowing our confidence is in the Lord. My strength doesn't rely on me. My restraint my strength relies in him. Now, most of you, you know, through the years I've explained to you, I wasn't always a, a preacher. I wasn't always a Christian. I didn't get saved till later. And I got in a little bit of trouble here and there. You know, I was one I always thought I had to prove myself. Now, some of you might find this really strange to believe, but there was a day, you see old Benjamin back there, there was a day that was my size. And I'm not talking about birth. I'm talking about, you know, going up into my teens. So if you said something to me, I felt like I had to prove myself to you. And, and I got in more than a few fights. 
And I learned how to fight. I tease Zach all the time. Zach, you know, he's growing. I said, buddy, I said, I might be getting older and slower. I said, but I got wisdom. And, and by the way, what I tell them nowadays, now that I'm, I'm over the other side of 50 and even slower, I tell them I got wisdom and I'll cheat. Hey, you go fight, win. Amen? All right. But I learned as I began to serve Jesus, guess what? He didn't need me to stand up like that. All he needed me to do was stand for him. He would fight as we sung in the song. He would fight the battle. The next thing that we notice here in verse 8 is we notice that John was simple. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. Again, would you go to see a man dressed as, as soft as delicate clothing? Jesus says the place for that type of person is not in the wilderness. The place for that type of person is in, in, in the castle. They need to be in the castle, not in the wilderness. I remember several years ago when you remember when the tornado came through. Uh, and they were coming to, to interview, and they wanted to interview me because our church was helping do the outreach. And most of you know, I was, I was right in with all of them. I, we were cutting logs, rebuilding, doing, I mean, I, you know. And so kind of got stuck working, and they show up, and, uh, you know, I'm like, man, somebody else, somebody else go talk to these people. I said, look at me. I mean, I'm, I, you know, my shirt was all sweaty. I'm just, I mean, it's just dirty red and whatever. And they said, no, you need to go talk to them because you're not just standing in the background pointing directions. You're actually out there working where the work needs to be done. And there's a lot to that. Y'all know me. I, I tease these preachers all the time with, the, you know, their ties and their suits and all this, you know, just all decked out. and all. You, you go ahead. Do, do, do you. But that shop that Jesus got his ties from went out of business and I just don't go get them anymore. Some of y'all figure that out on your way home. You know what a verse like this tells me? God's not as much concerned about our apparel looking fancy as it is that we're out there doing the work. Get out there and do the work. He was simple. John had a mission, and he was accomplishing the mission. Now, how you, how you book, how you, how you go doing so far on your list? Are you steady? Are you simple? Listen to these ones. Verse 9 and 10, we see that he was selected. What then did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. He said, who'd you go out looking for a prophet? He said, oh, you found a prophet. You, you found much more than a prophet. You found the one that God had chosen to be the herald of the Messiah, the one that had been chosen to announce it. John himself was prophesied by the prophets. So he himself had been prophesied that he would come and that he would prophesy and prepare the way for the Messiah. Many had spoken of the coming Messiah. John was the one that was chosen to say, He is here. He was selected by God. That was John. That's your, and, and, and again, we don't have time to really get into John's life, but that's what John was chosen to do. Many said he's coming, but John had the privilege of saying he's here. And then we see in verse 11 that he was special. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus said there was nobody born of a woman that was greater than John. I don't know about you, that's quite a testimony, amen? But then look what Jesus says. 
Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He said, preacher, it sounds like Jesus is contradicting himself. There's none greater, and then there is one greater. Which is it? Is there none greater, or is there one greater? Well, John, though he was great, he was not born under the new covenant because he lived and died before the completion of that covenant by Jesus. Jesus had not yet completed the redemptive work on the cross when John died. That being the case, he did not get to enjoy the benefits of the new covenant. Didn't make him any less saved. Didn't make him any less a child of God. They're just things. I don't think we realize how great it is to be a child of the new covenant. The blessings that we have that God has given. We get to look, you know, the, the whole, think about it, the whole Old Testament, they're looking at what's going to happen. And they're hoping that it happens. Guess what? We don't have to hope that it happens. We know that it happened. I tell people all the time, the cross is the center. The Old Testament looked forward to the cross and what was going to happen there. We look backward at the cross and we see what happened there. We have the benefit of knowing, yes, it did happen. And I don't know about you, but that makes us a little bit more blessed than those that were hoping it was to come. Let me ask you a question. Y'all going to eat afterwards? Where are we going? Bojangles. That's the Taylor family, Bojangles. Now, it's a blessing to, to anticipate that food, isn't it? I mean, you're anticipating, you've got the taste for that meal in your mouth, isn't it? And that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thought. We, we're out to eat. We're getting ready to eat. We're... Now, which is more blessed, thinking of what you're going to eat or when that food comes and you get to eat? Well, sometimes today, probably thinking toward it was more than the, but that's another story. I know my wife, I, I text her sometimes. I say, what's for dinner? And she'll tell me. And then she gets home, I'll come in from working, and it's something else. I'm going, wait a minute, I thought you said we were having, well, I changed my mind. But you don't understand. You got these taste buds I already started working toward that other thing. Am, am I the only one? Your mind, your taste buds have already started tasting that meal that you'd been promised, and then they changed the meal on you. That just messes everything up. Now, you skinny people don't know what I'm talking about, but the rest of us, we, we know what we're talking about. So that's what he's saying here. It's not that they were more, they, they were part of the new covenant. That's why he's saying that person is blessed. Honestly, I, I struggled with a breaking point in this sermon. I don't like to put God on a clock, and I will never put God on a clock, but there is a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. Truth is, if I continue to the next verse, then i got to continue to the next six verses. And y'all are going to quit listening long before I finish that. Especially now that I have mentioned lunch and your taste buds are starting to go. And anticipate what you're going to have. So as you'll see next week, Jesus is going to tie what he is saying about John uh, and him being in prison into the woes that he is getting ready to pronounce on the unrepented cities. So these verses will go just as well with next week as they would this week. And so I've decided to, to stop right there at 11 and we'll pick up there next week. But before we do that, I, I want you to understand there's a lot of things that we covered this morning that God wants you to deal with. Number one, we need to understand John was looking for evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. There's no problem asking for proof as long as we're going to make the right decision when we get it. Why should God prove himself to you if you're not going to trust him anyway? Maybe you're hitting, sitting here this morning and, and you have your doubts. Are you willing to dig into this book? Are you willing to find the truth? Are you willing to ask the right questions? Are you willing to talk to the right people so that you can get an understanding? It's not a problem that you don't know everything, that you don't have the answers. None of us do. The question is, are you going to seek the answers? 
John needed some answers, and so he sought the answers. Second, what do you do with the proof when it has been given to you? Jesus will prove himself faithful if we just give him a chance to do so. All we have to do is give him a chance to prove himself faithful, and he will prove himself faithful. And the third thing that we see is there's not one of us in this room that is not special in the eyes of God. And he's called each and every one of us for work for him. So I ask you, return to those questions. Remember I told you you need to think about those? Are you steady in your stand for Christ? Or are you blown around like that reed in the wind? Have you decided where you're going to stand and are you firmly planted there? Are you simple when it comes to standing for Jesus or are you trying to impress people? Folks, if they see more of us than they do of Jesus, then we have failed. We're not trying to put on a show. We're not trying to impress people. We're trying to tell people about Jesus. Keep it simple. Everybody know the KISS acronym? All right. My wife says I can't say that last word from the pulpit. So I'm going to walk over here and say it. Keep it simple. It's not about you. It's about him. And I can tell you this. You are selected. You say, preacher, how do you know? Because everybody in this room is part of the whoever group. What, you say, what's the whoever group? John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We're all part of that. Everybody's included in that. So I can promise you that Jesus uh, has selected everybody to come. The question is, are we going to come? It's not, have you been invited the question is, are you going to accept the invitation? I can also tell you that you're special. I wouldn't dare say that I'm greatest, and I doubt that you would do that either. But you can say you belong to Jesus. And that union that we have with Jesus, guess what? That makes us special. And I'm not talking about, oh, he's special. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that special relationship that we are able to have with Jesus Christ because we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. That special relationship that you have that allows you to lay your head on your pillow tonight knowing if this is the last day that you have on this earth that you will be with him for eternity. John the Baptist found himself in prison because he refused to compromise his stand for God. There are temptations every day that are going to tempt us to do the same thing. The only way that we will be able to stand is to trust Jesus, obey his word. Do what he's called us to do. Can you and will you make that commitment to him fresh and new this morning? God, I'm going to be steady. I'm going to stand for you. Doesn't matter what anybody else says, because I'm going to tell you, church, we've not seen anything yet. When we talk about pressure on the church and pressure to compromise our stand, you, th you think we've got it difficult. We haven't seen the difficult time yet. You know, you watch our political atmosphere right now. Isn't it amazing how these people suddenly found God? And how suddenly something they didn't believe, now they do believe, or something that they do believe, now they don't believe. Isn't that amazing? And we all know the day after elections, what's going to happen? They're all going to go right back to where they were. You know what that is? That's a reed shaking in the wilderness. You need to decide where you're going to stand and stand there, no matter how hard the wind blows. And the only way you can do that is if you're planted on the truth of Jesus Christ. So will you come and surrender yourself? God, plant me on this book. Help me to stay steady. And let's face it, Lord, help me to stay simple. 
Let's not make it about me. Let's make it all about him. Because if they're focused in on us and not on him, then we have failed miserably. Because our responsibility is to point people to Jesus. Can you say that this morning? Sam's going to come. He's going to play. I've asked him to play trust and obey. That's all I want you to do this morning. I want you to come down to this altar and say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to listen to you. Help me be like John. If it takes me to prison, it takes me to prison. But help me stand for what's right. Help me stand for the call of God. Will you do that this morning? Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you again for the day that you've given. Lord, for another opportunity to spend in your word. We thank you, Lord, for the example that John set before us. And Lord, that even when he had questions, Father, Lord, he sought the answers. And Lord, we know that he will eventually give his life because of his faith in you. Father, the question today is, would we do the same? Are we that committed to you? Lord, help Lord many respond to this altar this morning, saying they are going to stand. Lord, to seek your guidance and direction to help us to stand steady. And to seek your guidance and direction to help us be simple. Help us, Lord, to fade into the background. And Lord, point people to you. Help us not to get in the way of your message. And we'll praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen.